I miss Tina Brown. All right, I got something to talk about today. But first, I, I, I have to mention something. These, 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 these dumb f idiot neo-Nazi guys that like had this crazy plan that was absolutely disgusting to kill minorities and then try to kill uh, Barack Obama. The, the fact that they were actually planning to drive in a car wearing white tuxedos and white top hats. Um, are these guys neo-Nazis or severely, severely repressed same-sex couples? Because that sounds like more like a mixture of Thelma and Louise and a f***ing Elton John video. Anyway, f*** you guys. Anyway, we're going to move on to the topic of the day. Here we go. Uh, you may have heard about this New Yorker article profiling Cliff Blazinski and Gears of War 2. Um, it's kind of cool. New Yorker, respectable magazine, you know, one of the pillars of American publishing, even though it had to have its ass saved by a British publisher back in 1993, but we're going to pass on that one. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of my colleagues have noticed some things in this article. Uh, it was rather patronizing to Cliff and to kind of the game industry as a whole. Uh, though, I want to isolate a couple things. Um, I love this line. The gaming media is largely made up of obsessive enthusiasts. Now, obviously, obsessive enthusiasts is being mentioned as if it's some sort of pejorative. I don't know. Jonas Salk might have been an obsessive enthusiast about trying to cure polio. Most scientists I know tend to be obsessive enthusiasts. I don't know. Uh, I would say most of the movie critics I've ever met tend to be obsessive enthusiasts. It kind of makes sense when you pick this kind of ridiculous line of work, reviewing and talking about an entertainment form. And I don't see what you would expect me to be as some sort of distant, bored, cynical bastard. Because you know what? That doesn't make for good writing, as evidenced in your piece. Anyway. Moving on, uh, there's also all this kind of fun made of the fact that, you know, he was asked to not talk about a certain weapon that hadn't been revealed and that there was something odd about this and that he talks to Jeff Bell, who says the way you get to the core audience is through secrets. And he says it with an evil little twinkle in his eye, like what, he's trying to poison the eastern seaboard? Mm, hyperbole. Uh, look. It's a well-known fact that this is an exclusive-driven industry, and by that I mean the, uh, the game journalism side. I'm not a huge fact that I have to be scrambling for exclusives to try to lay claim to something, but you know what? That's how it works. And last I checked, the New Yorkers were trying to make a name for itself with exclusive articles written by Seymour Hersh trying to talk about the Pentagon's secret plan to invade Iran. Guess what? You guys engage in secrets too, and you engage in those same kind of exclusive content. I'll be frank. That's a little bit more pertinent to the existence of every American in this country than if there's a new weapon that we haven't talked about in Gears of War. And you know what? As a result, that's why sometimes there's a little bit of bargain making when you go out and you do these interviews. You might do the interview a few months early, but with the agreement that it's not going to run until it's closer to a certain time. That's how you get access. That's how a lot of entertainment journalism is done. It's actually practiced in other facets of journalism because there are bargains that are made ahead of time about not to ask certain questions pertaining to this subject. This happens in political interviews. Trust me, go watch CNN. Um, this is really just trying to make something odious and a little bit sort of you know, patronizing. This is really a very common practice. It is not unique to games. It is not unique to game journalism. This really came across as a very sad piece where someone who clearly actually seems to be into games was too embarrassed to acknowledge that in the pages of The New Yorker, who we must assume has a readership that is exclusively made up of the Upper East Side. No, actually, I read it too. And you know what? I know a lot of intelligent people that are in this industry that are not the fat mouth breathers that you try to imply through obsessive and Enthusiast. In fact, I like to talk a lot with other people, but just not on the show, about the crisis of authorship you can have in RPGs because the player actually has the ability to shape their own story. So really, who is the creative force behind it? Is it entirely the developer, entirely the player? I love the concept of semiotics as practiced in video games all the time because somehow it's an innate coding in most of the young men out there because they know exactly what to do the minute they hold the controller and look at a game because of the visual language there. Yes, you know what? You're not the only smarty pants. I'm just not in the pages of New Yorker to claim it. <laughs>